Chapter 15 of An Elementary Study of Insects. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeffrey Smith. An Elementary Study of Insects by Leonard Haseman. Chapter 15 the plant louse for this chapter any common species of plant louse may be used if the study is made in the spring the louse on rose apple clover wheat or any other crop may be used if the study is made in the fall the species on turnips corn or other plant or crop may be selected the different species vary greatly, but for these studies any available species will be satisfactory. The plant louse, or aphis, is a sap-sucking insect which feeds and multiplies rapidly, often seriously injuring crops. The loss of sap, together with the poisoning effect of the bite, causes the weakening of the plant or leaf with its ultimate death if feeding continues. The greatest damage is usually done during cold springs or during a cool, rainy period. This prevents the enemies of the louse from increasing and attacking it, while the weather may not be too severe to prevent the louse from working. Under favorable climatic conditions, the natural enemies of the louse, as a rule, are able to hold it in check. The principal enemies of the louse are certain small insect-feeding birds, lady beetles, surfid flies, lace wings, and tiny wasp parasites. The beneficial work of the lady beetles is discussed in an earlier chapter, the birds and lady beetles devour them bodily. The larvae of the lace wings and surfid flies extract their blood, while the wasps live as internal parasites. In the latitude of Missouri, the plant lice, as a rule, live through the winter in the form of a fertile egg attached to the twigs of trees and shrubs. The winter egg is produced by a true female plant louse. As a rule, there is only one generation of true males and females produced each year. This brood develops late in the fall to produce the fertilized winter eggs. In the spring, these eggs hatch and the tiny nymphs begin to extract sap. On maturing, they begin to give birth to young lice. Throughout the summer, this method of reproduction continues. These summer forms are known as stem mothers or agamic females. These are not true females, for they produce living young in place of eggs, and during the summer no male lice are produced at all. This is nature's way of increasing the race of plant lice rapidly. Late in the fall, again, a brood of true males and females is produced. During the summer, the plant lice increase more rapidly than any other type of insect. Plant lice vary in size, color, and general appearance. Many are green, while some are red or black, or covered with a cottony secretion. Observations and Field Studies Plant some melon, radish, or other seeds in fertile soil in pots for use in this study. When lice appear on crops in the garden or field, collect a leaf with a few on it and carefully transfer them to the leaves on your potted plants. Watch the lice feed and increase from day to day. A reading lens or a magnifying glass will be helpful as plant lice are very small. How do they move about? Can you count their legs? 
how many have they can you see their eyes and feelers when feeding observe how the beak is pressed against the leaf disturb one while it is feeding and see it attempt to loosen its mouth parts in the garden examine and see if you can find lady beetles or other parasites attacking the lice collect some of the enemies of the lice for your collection make a gallon of tobacco tea by soaking one pound of tobacco stems or waste tobacco in one gallon of water for a day or use one ounce of forty percent nicotine sulfate in three gallons of soap suds and spray or sprinkle infested bushes or vegetables with it in an hour examine and see what effect it has had on the plant lice nicotine is the most effective chemical for killing plant lice do any of the lice develop wings if so how many wings develop on some of the lice at times when a plant or crop becomes too heavily infested by them this enables some of the lice to spread to new food plants before old plants are completely destroyed and the colony of lice starved make a careful enlarged drawing of a winged plant louse and a wingless one showing legs feelers beak honeydew tubes on back and body segmentation if ants are seen to attend the lice observe them carefully and describe their work the ants feed on a sweet honeydew excretion discharged by the lice end of chapter 15 Chapter 16 of An Elementary Study of Insects. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeffrey Smith. An Elementary Study of Insects by Leonard Haseman. Chapter 16 the honeybee simple and sweet as their food they eat no flesh of the living von kubel one can hardly believe that this small ever busy creature each year gathers many million dollars worth of products for man in this country alone to say nothing of its inestimable value on the farm and especially in the orchard where it assists in carrying pollen from blossom to blossom it is of far greater value to man as a carrier of pollen than it is as a honey gatherer and yet under especially favorable conditions in one year a strong colony may produce between twenty five and thirty dollars worth of honey the general habits of the bee are fairly well known by all they live in colonies consisting largely of workers one female or queen and males or drones whenever the number of workers becomes sufficiently large to warrant a division of the colony a young queen is reared by the workers and just before she matures the old queen leaves with about half of the workers to establish a new colony this division of the colony is called swarming if a hive box or other acceptable home is not provided soon after the swarm comes out in clusters it may fly to the woods and establishes itself in a hollow tree where the regular work of honey gathering is continued this accounts for so many bee trees in the woods the bee has been handled by man for ages but it readily becomes wild when allowed to escape to the woods the bee colony offers one of the best examples to show what can be accomplished by united effort 
where harmony prevails. Certain of the workers gather honey, others are nurses for the queen and young brood in the hive, others guard the hive and repel intruders, and others care for the hive by mending breaks and providing new comb as it is needed. Each knows its work and goes about it, without interfering with the work of others. It is one huge assemblage of individuals under one roof where harmony and industry prevail. Throughout the long, hot summer days, the workers are busy from daylight until dark, gathering nectar, while at night they force currents of air through the hive to evaporate the excess water from the nectar. When flowers are not available near the hive, they simply fly until they find them, be it one, two, or more miles. As long as they are able to gather honey, they continue to do so, and when they give out, they drop in the field and are forgotten, others rushing to take their place. Often when winter is approaching and the store of honey is low, the less vigorous ones are cast out from the hive and left to die. If man could learn a few of the lessons which the bee teaches, he would be a better, a more useful, and a wiser addition to society. Observations and Studies Go into the fields and study the work of the bee. Follow it from flower to flower. See if it visits different kinds of flowers, or if it gathers its whole load of honey from one kind. Make a list of all the blossoms you find bees visiting. Does the bee move slowly from flower to flower? Can you see it thrust its tongue into the flower? How long does it stay on one blossom? Does it visit red clover? Pull a red clover blossom apart and compare the depth of the blossom with the length of the honeybee's tongue and determine the reason why it does not visit red clover. The bumblebee has a much longer tongue so it can get the nectar from red clover blossoms. Without the bumblebee, clover seed could not be successfully grown. Can you see small balls of yellow pollen on the hind legs of the bee? The pollen is collected from blossoms and is pasted on to the outside of the hind legs in the pollen basket. When the bee returns to the hive, it stores the small balls of pollen in the cells of the comb for use later in the preparation of bee bread. When the bee is disturbed in the field, does it fly away or will it sting? When it stings, does it always lose its sting? What makes the sting of the bee poisonous? Examine the wings of bees in the field and note how they are torn from continued work of gathering honey. The older ones often lose so much of their wings that they can no longer carry loads of honey. Where is the honey carried, and how is it placed in the honey cells in the hive? Go now to a hive and study the bees as they go and come. Do those returning fly as fast as those which leave? Why not? When they return, do they come direct to the mouth of the hive? Do those which leave fly direct from the hive or circle about first? Can you detect guards which move about at the entrance of the hive? What happens when a fly or other insect alights near the opening? Will the bees sting when you disturb them about the hive? If possible, study the colony inside the hive. To do this, you will need smoke to subdue the guards and a veil to protect the face. Can you find the queen? Is she larger than the workers? Examine for honeycomb, bee bread, 
worker brood, queen cells, and drone cells. If possible, study the actions of a colony while swarming. Write a brief report of what you can learn of the life, work, and habits of the honeybee. Happy insect, what can be in happiness compared to thee? Fed with nourishment divine, the dewy morning's gentle wine. Nature waits upon thee still, and thy verdant cup does fill. Tis filled wherever thou doest tread, nature's self thy Ganymed. Thou doest drink and dance and sing, happier than the happiest king. All the fields which thou doest see, all the plants belong to thee. All the summer hours produce, fertile made with early juice. Man for thee does sow and plow, farmer he and landlord thou. From the Greek of Anacreon End of chapter 16、Chapter 17 Recording by Jeffrey Smith. An Elementary Study of Insects by Leonard Haseman. Chapter 17 The Ant. The ants are closely related to the bees and are similar to them in many respects. They live in colonies consisting of workers, drones, and a queen. The males or drones appear at swarming time, and the workers are divided into various castes warriors, guards, nurses, etc. Those families of ants, however, which seem to have what approaches real intelligence, far outstrip the bees in many respects. In some cases, ants seem to be able to plan and carry out lines of work very much the same as man does. The various stages of human intelligence or races of men, from the savage to the intelligent man, are, in a way, similar to the various races of ants. There are ants which live as hunters, others which live as shepherds, and still others more highly developed. Which grow crops either in or near the nest, as is the case with the fungus growing ants. This striking similarity between the development of ants and man offers ground for much speculation. Some ants may be of considerable value to man, while others are the source of great annoyance and injury. The tidy housewife usually places the ant in the same category with cockroaches and bed bugs, and the corn growers attribute much of the injury to young corn to the work of the small cornfield ant, which acts as a shepherd of the corn root louse. Ants are usually more destructive by protecting and caring for other pests than by attacking the crop direct. Every country child is familiar with ants. They are met every day during the summer, scampering across paths, tugging at some unfortunate insect, or sticking to one's tongue when he eats berries. Ants are as numerous as the stars in the skies and vary in size. They are found from the tropics to the frozen north, in deserts, swamps, And in fact, almost any place where plants or animals live. They do not waste time building or manufacturing a complicated nest, like wasps or bees. So when food is scarce or for other reasons they need to move, they simply pack up and migrate. 
this together with the fact that they feed on almost every imaginable kind of plant and animal material accounts in part for the fact that they are the rulers of the insect world studies and observations it is easy to study the outdoor life of ants but it is most difficult to follow their activities in the nest go into the field or out on the school grounds and watch along paths or bare spots for ants. Soon, red or black fellows will be seen hurrying along after food. Ants are always in a hurry when they are after food. Follow them, and watch them catch and carry home small insects. If they do not find worms or other small insects, Drop a small caterpillar near one of them and see what happens. Can they drag away a caterpillar as large as themselves? Some of them may be after honeydew, fruit juice, or other material of this nature, and they should be observed collecting it. Ants collect about plants or shrubs which are overrun with green lice and feed on a sweet liquid which the lice produce. Watch them collect the honeydew from the lice. Do they injure the lice? Can you see the two short tubes on the back of the louse? Locate an ant nest or hill. Observe the workers carrying out small pellets of earth or gravels. Is the earth they bring out the same color as the surface soil? How deep may they go to get it? Do they move about as if they were in a hurry? Who sends them out with the earth? Why do they bring it out? Is it dropped as soon as the ant comes out of the hole, or is it carried some distance? The small ant found along paths usually makes a small ridge all the way around the entrance. While some of the ants are making the nest, Others are collecting food. Watch for some of these and see what they bring. Do they stop to eat before going down into the nest? Dig into a large ant hill and see what can be found. Describe briefly what is found. Do you find any small soft grubs and oval cocoons? These are the young ants and they are perfectly helpless and must be fed bathed and cared for by the workers or nurses the workers pick these up between their pinchers and carry them away when the nest is disturbed do the workers fight to protect the nest collect some of the workers which are carrying away the young and keep them in a jar with bits of bark and see what they do with the young Describe briefly what you are able to find out about ant life and behavior. Also make drawings of an ant, the young, and a nest. A pinsy ant, right trig and clean, came a day widding o'er the green, where to advance her pride she saw a caterpillar moving slaw. Good even to ye, mistress aunt, said he. How's I at home? I'm blithe to see ye. The saucy aunt viewed him with scorn, nor would civilities return. But gecking up her head, quoth she, Poor animal, I pity thee. A scarce can claim to be a creature, but some experiment in nature. Was silly shape displeased her eye and thus unfinished was flung by. For me I'm made with better grace, with active limbs and lively face, and cleverly can move with ease, fra place to place where'er I please, can foot a minuet or jig, and snoot like only whirligig, which gars my jaw aft grip my hand, till his heart pity patties and... But lay my qualities I bring to stand up clashing with the thing, a creepy thing the like of thee, not worthy, O, oh, a farewell to ye. The airy ant sign turned awa, 
and left him with a proud guffaw. The caterpillar was struck dumb and never answered her a mum. The humble reptile fanned some pain, thus to be bantered with disdain. But tent nice time the ant came by, the worm was grown a butterfly. Transparent were his wings and fair, which bear him flightering through the air. Upon a flower he stopped his flight, and thinking on his former slight, thus to the ant himself addressed, Pray, madam, will ye please to rest? And noticed what I now advise, Inferiors ne'er too much despise, For fortune make ye sick a turn, to raise a boon ye what ye scorn. For instance, I now spread my wing in air while you're a creeping thing. Alan Ramsey. End of chapter 17. End of An Elementary Study of Insects by Leonard Haseman.